actually, <laughs> personally. Or the last one, because <laughs> that implies it's already there. Yeah. Even that. 
Okay, everyone, I hope you got all of your trivia answers down. Hello. Hi. Hello. How's it going? Thank you. Okay, I hope you got all of your trivia answers down. Please bring your sheets and your golf pencils to Sam to turn in now, including the golf pencils. Please do not forget the golf pencils. <laughs> Dude, when I first made the slide deck, that background picture, if you download it from NASA, it's like 125 megabytes. Really? And so, and I have been there like three times. So I, uh, thank you. So I, uh, I had to like compress it and make it, because oh, I was trying to send it to you. My, my presentation was like, in, like 200 megabytes. Well, well done. And you got the slides up here. Can you hold down the button to turn it on? You got it. Okay, everyone. Hopefully, you're getting trivia sheets to Sam. If you still have trivia sheets to turn them in, uh, to turn in, please bring them to us here at the front quietly. Um, we are going to grade your trivia sheets during the talk and then uh, announce the winners in between our speakers. Um, so, without further ado. It is my pleasure to welcome our first speaker of the night, Trent Thomas. Trent is a graduate student. Yeah, we can. <laughs> Trent is a graduate student in the Earth and Space Science Department at UW, and he works with Dr. David Catling. Right. Yep. He's also in the astrobiology program, um, and so please welcome Trent. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna move this up. Hey everybody, um, thank you for coming. Um, I've never done one of these before and I didn't know this many people showed up, so I'm very excited about that. You can all hear me all right? That good? Okay, uh, let's raise the mic. Better? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go with that and try to speak closer into it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, okay, no worries. Um, okay, so anyway, um, on to the science. Um, so the name of my talk is Mars, Why the Hype? Um, so I'm gonna talk a lot about Mars, but before I get into that, I do wanna introduce myself so that you believe me um, for the next 20 minutes when I talk about Mars. Um, so my name is Trent Thomas. Um, I'm a big fan of Mars in general. Um, like Megan said, I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington, um, and I've done research on Mars for the last four or so years um, at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And we have a paper on it, I'm wearing the same jacket in that picture at a conference. Um, and all of this is here uh, just to tell you that um, I really like Mars, and I want you to believe me, at least, for the next 20 minutes. Um, so now on to the science. Um, so the name of the talk is Mars, Why the Hype? Uh, but specifically, I want to answer this question for everybody. Uh, why do we spend so much time and money studying Mars? Um, over the last couple weeks, I've like subtly polled my friends and family who aren't you know, weird space people, and uh, I found that they have vague answers to this question. Like, you know, they know some general things, but once you really ask about it, I realize people might not know exactly why everyone cares about Mars so much. Um, and so my goal here is to demystify that for everybody. Um, so first, I want to actually talk about how much time and money do we spend on Mars. Um, so if you break it down uh, by number of NASA missions uh, by destination, so this is in the history of NASA from about 1960, um, Mars is by far our most common destination. And it's more than double uh, the second most common destination, which is Venus. So over 38 times just NASA alone uh, has gone to Mars. Um, and when you expand uh, beyond NASA, to the world and all the other countries that have a space program. Uh, there's over 50 missions starting from 1960 um, go, that have uh, gone to Mars, and they've gone in different capacities. Uh, there's been flyby missions um, where you know, a spacecraft kind of just zips past and tries to take pictures of the surface. Uh, there's been orbiters that stay a while and take better pictures and better measurements. Um, and there's also uh, the landers and the rovers, which are oftentimes uh, the fan favorites. 
So uh, Curiosity ended in 2012. Shout out if you got the trivia question right. Um, and then Perseverance uh, right now um, is uh, landed last year and is getting great results. Um, and then this trend is here to stay. Um, in the next uh, couple decades, uh, one of the top priority missions uh, for NASA is Mars sample return, where we're going to bring rocks back from Mars. Um, and this is, you know, decades in the making. This is a super complex, intense mission. Um, and just to say that this trend of studying Mars is uh, ongoing. Um, and you can also break it down by funding. Uh, so NASA robotic missions, uh, so non-crewed missions, which may not have a scientific motivation, maybe geopolitical. Um, if you break it down by destination, uh, Mars, we've, got, we've spent the most money uh, by a lot. We spent $29 billion adjusted for inflation on Mars um, in the last 60 years since the space program started. Uh, but for context, this is just a drop in the bucket. Um, the total cost of the Perseverance rover is $2.7 billion from design to construction to launch and operation for a couple years on Mars. Uh, this is exactly equivalent to running the Department of Defense for 33 hours um, or Disney's global box office revenue from Avengers Endgame. Um, so it may seem like a lot of money, um, but it's really a drop in the bucket. And uh, just a, a, a couple more hours of the Department of Defense would go a long way um, for uh, scientific discovery on Mars. So anyway, just keep that in mind. Um, so I hope I've shown you we do spend a lot of time and money studying Mars. Um, so now I'm going to get into the meat of exactly why we've done all this, why we sent, uh, NASA alone has sent 38 missions and we spent $29 billion. Um, so I'm going to break it down into three reasons. So one, Mars is close. Two, uh, Mars is easy to study. And three, Mars is scientifically interesting. So first, Mars is close. So uh, this figure is showing uh, the travel times to the different planets in the solar system um, from Earth. And this is based on uh, previous missions that have been launched. So starting with the furthest out planets, the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, they're all six years or more away uh, by mission. Now, other missions, uh, like the Voyager spacecraft, for example, uh, have gotten there uh, a lot faster um, in fraction, uh, fractions of, of these times listed. Uh, however, they're flyby missions, and they zipped right past all these planets and just got some nice pictures for us. Um, however, if you want to uh, design a mission to orbit these planets or land on one of the moons of these planets, um, you have to take into, in, into consideration uh, that you need to speed up and then slow down. And both of these processes uh, require a lot of fuel, which is weight on your spacecraft. And the engineers, uh, when they are trying to design these missions, have to take that um, into account. And that goes into the long travel times. On the other hand, uh, Mercury uh, on the inside um, is also about six years or more uh, away. Uh, but that's actually due to a different reason. It's because as you get closer to the sun, uh, your spacecraft gets sped up. And so you have to spend a lot more time trying to slow down with different uh, maneuvers. This leaves uh, the three planets in the middle here. Well, yeah. Venus, uh, Mars, and the Moon uh, are all uh, very good targets simply because they're close. Now, this travel time uh, matters uh, a lot uh, because when we're designing uh, scientific missions, uh, space exploration missions, uh, we generally design them in sequence. So we're going to launch one mission, get all the science we can out of that one mission, regroup, and then design another one uh, to launch. And so you can't really launch them in parallel or else you'll waste resources and time. Uh, so the difference in these travel times, five years for Mars to Jupiter, for example, really adds up when you want to send a lot of missions to one place. So the second point uh, is that Mars is easy to study. So these planets are not Mars, uh, but these planets are hard to study. Uh, so Venus, for example, uh, has 92 times uh, Earth's atmospheric pressure, and it is 870 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. Uh, so we've tried to send a few things to Venus, and they've melted. Um, the longest a spacecraft has lasted on Venus's surface is like 10 minutes. Um, so it's very difficult to study Venus. The outer planets, uh, so Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, are giant balls of gas. So they don't have a surface. You just go deeper in, and it just gets like foggier and like maybe like kind of wet. Like it's just very strange. You, you can't like land on them. Um, and then finally, uh, the icy moons, so Enceladus and Europa, which are moons of Saturn and Jupiter. Um, are really interesting uh, because they have you know giant oceans underneath a thick shell of ice uh, and we want to study them but that ice shell is actually very thick it's more than five kilometers thick and a lot more than five kilometers thick in a lot of places we've only successfully drilled about a kilometer into ice uh, on earth 
Um, and that's with all of our resources. So the ocean is very inaccessible. So this leaves Mars. And Mars is very comfortable. Uh, it has less than 1% of Earth's atmospheric pressure. Uh, so it's not going to crush your, crush your spacecraft. Uh, it is uh, a warm negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, it gets colder than this in Antarctica. And cold temperatures like this are actually very good for spacecraft. They keep the electronics cool. So Mars is comfortable for our rovers. But even more than that, Mars is easy to study because Mars' surface records the entire 4.5 billion year history of the planet. So what do I mean by this? On Earth, you know, we have a, a lot of water, a very active water cycle. We have plate tectonics, we have plants, we have people, and we all modify the surface of Earth and erode it away. So when a mountain forms on Earth, uh, geologically speaking, it gets eroded down to a flat plain very quickly. And so this is a problem when we're trying to study you know, the ancient part of Earth's history. But this is not a problem on Mars. Mars in, has been dry uh, for most of its history, and it preserves all of the features that uh, like, pop up throughout its history. So we can study the whole thing because the surface preserves everything. And the surface preserves a lot of really interesting stuff. Mars is an extremely dynamic and evolving planet. Uh, so, you know, sometimes Mars may appear as just a rock, but it has an active interior and this yields a lot of interesting things. So first, there's plenty of volcanism throughout Mars' history, and it's home to the largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons. Uh, second, there are Mars quakes, and that is a measurement of one. That is the data from the InSight lander that we've measured an earthquake on another planet. Uh, Mars has a very interesting magnetic field that was stronger in its early times and weak now. And Mars' atmosphere has been uh, stripped over the course of its history. It used to be thick, and now it is very thin because it's been bombarded by solar radiation. All of these processes are fundamental to how planets work, and they also occur and are related uh, to Earth. There's a volcano erupting in Hawaii right now. Uh, we discover where we, most of you have probably experienced an earthquake, and our atmosphere hasn't been lost to space because we have a better magnetic field than Mars. And furthermore, um, the, uh, an interesting thing to study about Mars is the difference between the three inner planets in our solar system, so Venus, Earth, and Mars. Venus, like I said, will melt your spacecraft. It is, has a runaway greenhouse effect. It's very hot. Earth is temperate and rich with water, and Mars is a dry desert. What's really interesting is that all three of these planets have a common origin. They formed under a very similar set of circumstances at the beginning of the solar system. So answering the question why they diverged so intensely uh, is a big question and still unanswered. Uh, and moreover, this question uh, is uh, even more important uh, because we live in a golden age of exoplanet astronomy. So, we've just, so exoplanets um, are planets orbiting other stars. When you look up at all the stars, odds are that basically all of them have other planets orbiting them, similar to the solar system. Um, and, and the James Webb Space Telescope, which a lot of you are also probably familiar with, is now giving us uh, incredible uh, resolution when we try to study these things, and we can learn much more about them than we ever have before. So when we look at planets that are similar to Earth and Mars, but they're not, and they're orbiting other stars, uh, it's really helpful to understand how those planets work in our own solar system. Okay, the last thing that's interesting about Mars is that there was water on ancient Mars. This is arguably the most interesting thing. I might be a little biased. Um, but to show you how we know this, um, I have a couple pictures up here. So this picture on the left uh, is a river delta from Siberia on Earth. And a river delta is when a river empties out onto a plain or small body of water uh, and dumps out all the sediment that it was carrying in a fan structure like this. Now, if you dried up this river delta and let it sit there for a few billion years, that is what it would look like. And these pictures are from Mars. These are dried up river valleys, or deltas, um, from Mars, from Jezero Crater uh, and from Eberswald Crater. You can tell just by looking at their shapes. And if that doesn't convince you enough, uh, we've chemically analyzed uh, the minerals in these deltas and found things like clays and carbonates uh, which can only form in the presence of liquid water. And we found much more features than just these deltas. We found uh, canyons carved out by ancient rivers. This is uh, on Earth, this is on Mars. And we found valley networks, which are kind of chains of ri rivers put together. Um, and if evidence like this is discovered every day. This paper was literally published last week, a week ago. Um, and these are new results from the Perseverance rover, finding more evidence that there was water in Mars's past. OK, there was water. What does that mean? Who cares? Well, surface liquid water is extremely rare in the solar system. And for that matter, as far as we know, the universe. Um, so on Earth, for example, water, we have oceans of water. 
It doesn't freeze, nor does it boil, because Earth isn't too hot or too cold. This, we take this for granted. Everywhere else in the solar system, on the surface of the planets and the moons, this is not the case. I mentioned those icy moons earlier with subsurface oceans. Those are underground. Those are completely different uh, than the surface environment that we know. The only other place we know in the history of the solar system, and I'm just going to keep extrapolating to the universe, uh, is ancient Mars. Um, this is the only other Earth-like uh, environment that we could ever study. Um, and the presence of liquid water is extremely important uh, when looking at this because all life on Earth requires liquid water. So this is kind of a smorgasbord of different environments uh, on Earth and all of which are inhabited by microbes. So we have acid mine drainage, deserts, nuclear waste, hot springs, volcanoes, sea ice, hyperacidic lakes, like uh, the deep ocean. All of these places are inhabited uh, by microbes under this wide range of chemical conditions. The one thing that they all have in common is that all of the microbes require water. We've never discovered uh, a microbe on Earth that can live and grow and, and survive without liquid water. And so this sets up, you know, the huge question about Mars. Was ancient Mars habitable? And if it was, was it inhabited? This is, in my opinion, the big question of why we keep going back to Mars. And it's unanswered only because it's so complicated. There are so many things that go into answering this question. We need to know, you know, how much water exactly was there? What was the temperature of the surface? What was the atmosphere made of? Was there a water cycle? How big was the atmosphere? Why did it all change? Why does Mars look so different today? When did it change? And if it was uh, inhabited, uh, how did organisms live there? Could they have survived until today? When people are looking for life on Mars today, or when people are talking about, you know, discovering methane or something on Mars that might indicate life, generally they're thinking it's life left over from this ancient Martian habitat where it was similar to Earth. So in general, we keep going back to Mars uh, to kind of piece by piece chip away at this big question by answering all of these small ones. And so uh, to summarize here, um, Mars is an extraordinary laboratory for answering fundamental questions uh, about life in the universe and planetary science. It's a good thing it's our neighbor. <laughs> That's it. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Sorry about that. Yeah. That is a fantastic question. Um, so the question was about uh, material being exchanged between uh, Earth and Mars. So like meteorites have been exchanged. We have Martian meteorites, for example, um, and we've sent spacecraft to Mars. And so does, does this make it difficult to you know, learn about life in the universe if it's, there's like this kind of contamination problem? And the answer is absolutely. Um, when we send spacecraft to Mars, uh, there's a very specific set of protocols we have to do to the spacecraft and rel related to planetary protection. So we have to like sterilize the hell out of the spacecraft. We have to like, you know, do all these processes to try to kill all of the microbes that live on our spacecraft. So we don't launch them to Mars and like inhabit Mars on our own, which we've inevitably kind of done already with all of the spacecraft we've sent. Um, ways to like mitigate that, uh, for example, are when we choose uh, our landing spots for our rovers, planetary protection is one of like the paramount um, considerations. You don't want to choose an environment that like where our microbes could just like hop off the spaceship and then like start a whole community. Um, so there's still like, you would think we've sent our rovers to the most like optimal and interesting locations, but there's actually a few that are even more interesting. We just haven't gone there because we want to make sure that we don't contaminate them. I hope that answered it. Cool. <laughs> Autumn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Mars is really interesting. So plate tectonics, if there are people who are not familiar with it, um, is kind of the, um, the geologic engine of Earth, for example. Um, it's where, you know, we have a bunch of plates floating along the surface. These are like the giant plates. And when they bump into each other, they cause earthquakes. One will dip below another and cause volcanoes. It's responsible for a lot of the things you see and a lot of geologic phenomena you see on Earth. And the question is, did Mars have plate tectonics? Um, and the answer is, I don't really know. And I don't think nobody, anybody knows. Um, Mars is really interesting um, because uh, it's, actually, it's a little bit smaller than Earth. And that may seem like a superficial difference, but it's very important. Um, the size of Mars means that its interior is actually significantly less active uh, than Earth's. So early in Mars's history, there's a lot of geologic activity. Um, it had, you know, overturning and may have had something similar to plate tectonics for like a second, um, but definitely not over long periods of time. No. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the question was, uh, what evidence or clues? Uh, point to Mars having an atmosphere, um, ancient Mars having an atmosphere. So uh, the first and most like kind of simplest line of evidence is actually the evidence for water. So if there's evidence for water flowing on Mars' surface, uh, that implies a very specific temperature range. It can't be too cold, it can't be too hot, as I've said before. Um, Mars is, you know, a little bit further from the sun than the Earth, and without an atmosphere, just like it is today, it'd be too cold, water would freeze. There's no water on the surface right now. It'll, it'll freeze uh, on the surface. Um, and so really the only way that has not been ruled out right now to keep ancient Mars's surface warm is a thick atmosphere with a strong greenhouse effect. So for example, maybe as thick as our atmosphere but made entirely of carbon dioxide um, or other greenhouse gases like methane or uh, hydrogen. Um, and this is consistent with um, the uh, what we observe about atmospheric loss today on Mars. So Mars is a very thin atmosphere, but we can see it being stripped away constantly by the solar wind. And if you extrapolate this back in time, you can you know, build up to how much there should have been if this is how much you've been losing over time. Um, and additionally, ancient Mars had uh, the magnetic field, which protected it so the atmospheric loss wasn't happening uh, more early in the solar system. Okay. Yeah, one more? Or yeah, done? One more. Okay. Uh, one more. Uh, yeah. Um, so yes. 
So Mars' atmosphere is being stripped away, first of all, just because, so the sun is, the solar wind is just a stream of uh, high intensity light and charged particles just constantly being fired at all of the planets in the solar system. And so uh, planets with magnetic fields, like Earth, for example, you know, if you stand here with a compass, there's a magnetic field. Um, it protects the planet from uh, that solar wind and our atmosphere is eroded very little. Like, so our atmosphere is protected. But uh, other planets, um, like, the, like the small planets that you expect not to have an atmosphere, um, that have like a very thin atmosphere, like some of the outer moons, for example, like Io, um, are subject to that solar wind just bombarding them and ejecting um, their atmosphere. It's, it should be prevalent in almost all the planets. The question is just to what degree exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>
Um, Bickerson's wanted me to announce that last call is at 8.30. So if you wait until after this talk is done, you will not be able to get more drinks. Just so you know. Okay, so at this time, it's going to be my pleasure to announce our final speaker of the evening. Uh, Chester Lee is going to be talking about hunting some little green men. He is a graduate student in the UW Astronomy Department. Um, and, and with that, I'll bring on Chester. Here's Chester. I always talk myself into a corner. All right. Wait. Is it on? All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Chester. I'm a first year grad student. And uh, I know you're all excited about learning more about UFOs and aliens. So we're going to get to it. All right, so before we get into the, the juicy details, let me share a story first. So this is um, Joshua Tree National Park. It's located very close to Los Angeles. Uh, as you can see that is, uh, there, is pretty far away from Seattle. And this on the right is called a light pollution map. And depending on the color of it, you can see that how bad the light pollution is and pink is the worst so, so you can see that in the city centers those are those have some pretty bad light pollution but um, one thing about Joshua Tree is that it is located in a uh, slightly less light polluted area so people go there to stargaze a lot which is um, so there are some uh, Joshua trees and some rocks but other than that is not an exciting place. I got to tell you that. And that was this, the trees and the rocks was not the reason I went there. I went there to stargaze, okay? I went there to see the Milky Way. So on July 5th, 2022, it was new moon. So that means that it's a basically a moonless night because you want to see this nice sky when there's no moon because the moon just get annoying sometimes because it's just obscure all the, uh, the nice details of the universe. So on this moonless night, I went on a stargazing trip with my friends, two other friends. So we were driving along here, along the path here. Maybe it's hard to see here, but it's here. So this is a car here. And I show you the campus here. So it's upper is north, uh, left is west, and, and uh, right side is east. So I was driving, and I, I was uh, to my left is east. 
So I was driving along this pretty dark path. And then I, I noticed something different, something weird. I just saw that there was a fire on the mountain. I was like, that is interesting. But then my friend just told me that there was no mountain. OK? I was like, what is that? It doesn't look like Jupiter or Mars. I mean, OK, this is, a, this is just a, a weird thought I put in. It's not real, OK? It's not a photo I took. So it just, I just wanted to show you that this is what I feel like I saw. I saw like an orange bright spot in the sky. I was like, how could something be so bright? It was brighter than Venus, which is one of the brightest object in the sky. I was like, all right, you know what? Time to trust the technology. And I pull, I pull up this Skyview app, which many of you may know, is basically an argumented reality app that you use to basically look at the constellations and look at the stars and different planets uh, to locate them. So I tried to match this orange bright spots with some celestial object that I could find on the app. You know what? I couldn't find anything. It was just there. I mean, okay, by this time, I already parked the car because I was like, this is kind of weird. I got I to gotta see w what the hell that it was. Okay? So, I w and then we stopped the car. We look at it, and then it started moving. Okay? And it was moving toward us. It basically zoomed across the sky in 20 seconds. This is not ordinary stuff, OK? How could something zoom across the entire sky in 20 seconds? And, it, and I was like, that's interesting. But I, I heard some engine sound. I saw some green flashes when it flew by. I was like, oh, yeah, that, that was just an airplane. There's a helicopter. There's no way. But then, OK, here's some, some, uh, some observational facts that we know. Okay, we are scientists here. We got we got to make some scientific arguments for the for the stuff we saw. So it was bright orange, which is very unusual because you know that airplanes they don't have the colors. They usually have red or green. So it it moved pretty fast, and I heard some engine sound and has some green flashes. Okay, those are comprehensible. I we can understand those, but the weird part is that why was why was it orange? And why could it stay on the sky for like stationary for a long time? Because before I stopped the car, it was like basically stayed at the same location of the sky. And it only moved, started moving after we, um, we parked. OK. All right. I, I will give you some time to, to think about it during my presentation. At the end, we will review some uh, what, what it actually is. Okay, all right, actually get, get, get out of the conspiracy. We're going to go back to science, okay? <laughs> all right. So this is the Drake equation. It is basically a, a, a random theoretical, completely theoretical equation that it basically pops out of nowhere, okay? It's, it's not scientifically based, to be honest, because uh, let, let's, take it, let's take a look at this equation, okay? So the n, which is the end result, is the number of technologically advanced civilization that we can find in our galaxy, and which is equal to a, a bunch of numbers multiplied together. So let's take a look at each of them. So first is the star formation rate in a galaxy. And the second one is the fraction of those stars that have planets. And going more into that, we. Uh, we have to this number Ne, which is the number of planets in that uh, solar system. And then we have the fraction of those planets that can potentially um, have those environments for the for light to develop. And then we have the, the fraction of those planets that actually um, have life. And then that the, the, the fraction that those life can are actually intelligent. And then <laughs> go on into those live can uh, relay some, some detectable signals that we can detect. And also, very important, the last one, is the length of time of the survival time of this uh, civilization. 
Okay, so those number and both all multiply together. We can get a number of how many serialization that we expect to have that we can detect in our own Milky Way. Okay, let, let's let's plug in some actual numbers because we we are astronomers, right? We all love numbers and equations and math. All right, so I have provided two possible numbers here, and uh, one of them is the lower limits, and one of them is the upper limits. And uh, so let's say we have 1.5 star forming in our galaxy each year. Uh, low, upper bound is three per year. And then we have these three uh, weird numbers multiplied together equal either a very, very small number or a pretty large number. And then we have those uh, other numbers, same uh, thing. And then we have like, uh, we um, speculate that for the last uh, variable, we can uh, suspect uh, that uh, 300 years is how long a civilization can last while it's uh, admitting signal to the, to the universe. Or it can be up to a pretty long time, depending on how long the civilization can last. So let's hope Earth can last long enough to, to be detected by alien first. But all those numbers, if we multiply them together, we can, get two lower, we can get a lower bound and an upper bound. So the lower bound is we, can ex we expect to find 9.2 times 10 to the negative 13 civilizations in our galaxy. What does it mean? That means that we are the only one. We, we are basically the only one in the entire galaxy or the entire universe possibly. So that is the lower bound. So what about the upper bound? Upper bound is 1.56 million civilizations in our own Milky Way. Can you, can you believe that? Of course not, because we haven't found aliens yet. But uh, OK, so those are our expectations, supposedly. Uh, you have to remember the assumption that this equation is completely made up. So <laughs> OK, but anyways, they could be out there. So the next question is, how do we hang them down? That is the, the science that they're going to get into today. So for the most part of my talk, it's going to be about technical signature. Is, here's the definition, is basically any measurable property or effects that provides scientific, scientific, okay, remember that, evidence of the past or present technology. So it's basically, as you see in this picture here, it could be some space junk that we always produce every year, every day, or it could be some signals that we're gonna get into next, in the next slide. Okay, so the first one is something called a Dyson Spear. I see some of you may, may have heard of that before. So the idea is it's basically a mega structure that is created by some pretty advanced civilization to harvest the energy of a, sun, of a sunlight star. And how do we do that? We basically put a lot of solar panels around the star. And that's how we do it, okay? I mean, that's how it's derealized to, to be done. And, um, Th that those solar panels or solar energy collectors would then surround the whole sun and then just get all the energy because we know the energy is pretty important. Otherwise, we wouldn't be going into the Middle East, right? So, in, so this is our solution, okay? This is our future solution to, to how to solve the energy crisis. And this is actually, there was a paper about this by Freeman Dyson in 1960. It's an actual published paper that I just realized today because I looked it up today. I was preparing the talk. <laughs> but uh, it was, the title was Search for Artificial Stellar Sources of Inter Infrared Radiation. And uh, put it in a simple way is how the heck do we find aliens near this kind of Dyson sphere? So how does it work? Why does it have to do with infrared radiation? Okay. So we got to get into this concept of a black body radiation. It's some pretty physics turn. So imagine you have an object. If it can, uh, so everything can absorb some kind of energy. And then it would get heated up because of, of the energy it absorbs. And then it would re-admit those energy in some kind of different wavelength. So if you look at the heaters around you, you can see that there's a tube around the, the fire. 
and the tube is actually absorb, absorbing some kind of an, those energy from the fire. And in fact, the tube, because of those energy absorbed, it would admit, readmit those, re radiate those energy in a different wavelength. And uh, sometimes you can see them if they get hot enough, so, but sometimes they don't. But so the, the, the idea is that those kind of solar panels or materials that we use to surround those, the sun-like uh, uh, sun -like star, it would absorb some kind of energy from the sun, the sunlight, and then re-radiate those energy. And the re-radiated energy, the wavelength of that light is depending on the composition, the material that it's made of, and the temperature of the collectors. And based on some, after some physics calculations, we can calculate that those re-radiated energy would be mostly in the wavelength of infrared. Okay, so now you know why we have to look for some excess infrared radiation, because those, the, that those sources could be Dyson spheres created by some advanced civilizations. So I was not joking, this is a scientific topic because people have actually studied them and tried to look for Dyson spheres using so many uh, di different instruments. And the first group is this uh, Fermi lab, which is pretty popular. It is a um, particle uh, accelerator lab at, uh, in uh, Illinois. And uh, they were used in 2005. They were using the, the IRAS, which is also called the infrared, astronomical satellites to look at all of those potential uh, Dyson spheres by looking at the infrared radiation. And they found seven of them. Does it mean that we found aliens? No, because they were called some potential ambi ambiguous can candidates. And four of them were, uh, were so-called amusing but questionable. But uh, till today, we have not confirmed any of those infrared sources are Dyson spheres. But then let's go to the next group, which is 2015, Planet Hunters. Um, it, it is a, a citizen science project that a, a bunch of citizen scientists, they are trying to use some Kepler telescope data to find exoplanets. And they noticed some kind of weird life fluctuation in this uh, start with the name KIC A four six two A five two. Yeah, star usually have some kind of weird names because there are just way too many of them. <laughs> so they were using this Kepler Kepler space telescope. It, it was um, it was launched to discover Earth-like exoplanets. So it detected this source, and then after uh, so two years later in two thousand seventeen, a Nature paper was published denying the possibility of a potential Dyson sphere source. Why was that? Because they discovered that the fluctuations were consistent with the dimming due to dust absorption. So once again, our, uh, our hope for finding, finding those advanced Dyson sphere was removed. So. That, that was the attempt, or there are always more attempts to find those events, uh, Dyson Spears. And uh, let's go to the next topic, the, another example of techno signatures, which is radio signals that we basically use every day. Communication, broadcasting, radar, GPS, or your Wi-Fi. You're using radio signal all the time. So, Assuming that there is another civilization that is very similar to the human race that would use uh, radio a lot to communicate or to do whatever we want. One hope is to find those radio signal emitted by some kind of extraterrestrial life. So that is another approach of finding aliens in outer space. And how do we do that? Of course, we use radio telescopes. So radio telescopes are similar but different from the conventional telescope that you think about, okay? It, it's good. it means that they can operate 24-7. You don't have to wait till nighttime 
to turn on the, the regular optical telescope. And the fact is that they do not take images, okay? They do not take like a nice image of the stars or the sky. They record the radio signals and convert them by computers into some kind of plot that you can see. And uh, they can basically see tens of thousands of light years away. So it, um, it, it's a pretty good tool for looking for extraterrestrial radio wave, uh, wave. And people use them to study quasar, I mean, pulsars, black holes, and a cosmic microwave background. And, um, and also people use that for SETI, which is search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And in this kind of weird place, uh, kind of some kind of wilderness in America, West Virginia and Virginia here, we have this so-called <laughs> National Radio Quiet Zone. What does it mean? That means that there's no Wi-Fi there. Oh, oops. That means that there's no Wi-Fi there. And uh, radio is, is not permitted because they have to focus on research. They have a bunch of those large radio telescopes located in this uh, national radio quiet zone, which people used to do a lot of research on stars, aliens, and stuff like that. So this is going to get into the... Uh, <laughs> yep, that's right. <laughs> this is going to get into the, the, the work that I worked on uh, about two years ago. So I was, I was at UCLA as an uh, undergrad, and I was in this SETI group. It was led by Professor John Luke Margo. And there was only one mission, one, only one goal, to find aliens, the first evidence of other civilizations. And uh, how do we do that? So first, we have to identify the candidates. Because in order for us to, to look at them, we have to first identify them and see which ones are the, the one with, most, uh, the, with the highest probability of finding alien life, OK? So we look at a bunch of stars. We have to look at the size of, a, of the habitable zone, which is uh, the size of the, the radius in which liquid water can exist on a planetary surface. Like, thanks, uh, Chen, for explaining all those stuff before. So that was, um, we, first, we need uh, some water, because we just assume that water is necessary. We don't know that if that's true, but we, we say that that's the case. And also, we have to look at the spectral type of the star. That is basically um, what is the color of the star and how massive it is. And because we know that there is a relationship between the mass of the stars and the lifetime of the, of the stars. So in this figure here, we can see that the x-axis is basically the, the, the mass of the star compared to our sun. And then the y-axis is the lifetime of the star. Okay, so we can see that uh, our sun, which is around here, has a pretty good lifetime of about 10 billion years. And if you go to lower massive star, they actually have a much longer lifetime, which allow for um, life to develop for a longer period of time. But if you go to the, the massive stars end, you can see that those massive stars, they, are pretty, they have a pretty short life because they burn their fuel so quickly so one of the requirements that we look for those uh, good candidates for, to point a telescope at is that we have to look for stars with about the same mass as our sun or lower mass. So those are two of the requirements that we look for. Of course, we have some other requirements. OK, so the second, now we got a target. All we need to do is to move the telescope, to point at it, and to observe it. Of course, we're going we're, we're gonna to use the big boy, the big 100-meter telescope, the big 100-meter Green Bank telescope. So, on, so we were scheduled to observe at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Wednesday, April 22nd, 2020. So it was about more than two years ago. But then something unexpected happened, of course. Every, every time you, you try to do something exciting, there's always something accident going to happen, OK? So, we were notified that the sub-reflector of the telescope, which you can see it, this, is this little thing at the top here, it has some malfunction. And we spent 
a lot of money. So, okay, so before we get into the money part, so it's like that when we get those telescope time, sometimes you can pay money to get time, to pay money to get them to observe something for you. So this is a, a project that we, we got to get some donors to donate some money to, for us to have some telescope time. So the time was kind of expensive. And then if this telescope was malfunction, that means that we're going to lose those telescope time. But the on-site director of the telescope was pretty generous. And after two hours of repairments, the telescope finally went back to work. And we were finally ready to observe those, the targets that we wanted. So at the end, the observation went pretty well. We observed 16 so extra solar systems. So basically 16 solar uh, system with stars and planets. And that, um, that day we collected so much data that required 48 hours to transport the data all the way from the telescope to our supercomputers at the rate of 20 megabyte per second. That was about 3,500 gigabytes. So, is, I mean, it, it's like a, a few of your computer, assuming you have like a, like a one terabyte computer. So that was a lot of data. So what, what do we do with them? And how do we find aliens out of those data? We gotta go to some, some, some boring data pipeline. Okay, of course. It's, it's not like once you, you, once you point a telescope at the target and, you, and then you get the data and then you're done. No, you gotta reduce the data, which means that you gotta calibrate the data. You gotta extract the useful infinite information. You gotta remove all the junk, all the misleading information from the, uh, from the original raw data. So we gotta go through a, a bunch of unpacking the data, doing some uh, Fourier transform, and we gotta do some calibration and then we gotta set up some filters to remove the bad data points or the, the bad signals that we detected. Because over that day, we detected millions of signals in, in that one single day. And we cannot say that we found millions of aliens because, because that's not the case. We, that, at most, there's gonna be, most likely there would be none, but we, we're hoping to find the one that we wanted. And um, so one of my tasks was uh, my, my part at this project was improving the ETI filters. So ETI stands for extraterrestrial intelligence filters. So I had to um, write some code to remove some, some kind of false positive results from this database. And at the end, oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. Also, I also signed non-disclosure agreements before I start the project. <laughs> 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 well, I, I think I'm, I'm just not supposed to tell you the code, but I think everything else is fine. <laughs> yes, all right, so I worked on some code to set up some kind of filter, and then we, we, we look for aliens. Did we find anything? I don't know. All right, so as I said before, the radio telescope, they do not take images. They record the signals. And this is what you get. This is what you get from, from the recording. It's, you can see that a, a bunch of noise. And uh, by performing some, uh, some Fourier transform, some, uh, some kind of weird frequency time transformation, we can extract the signal from, those, from these weird pictures, which is kind of useless. And we can see that did we detect an extraterrestrial signal? Did we, so we have to see the signal in two different scans, which means that first we move to the target, we take an image, we move off the target, take an image, and then we move back to the target, take an image. So we have two images of the same targets. And if the signal is presented at both scans or both images, that means that there's some kind of, um, potential candidates of some kind of weird signal we detected, okay? And uh, sometimes that could be due to Wi-Fi or satellites <laughs> or, or some kind of weird interference, even though it's a, a, a United States national crime zone, there's, also, there's 
sometimes some others, some other signals. So that's why we take two separate images to confirm that we have a confident source. And at the end, one of the people in the class actually found something interesting. And then I finished the class, so I never get any update. <laughs> right. I, I do not know if we found alien, but I, I assume no. I assume no, because otherwise it would be on the news. <laughs> okay, yeah, so there, there are always something interesting out of the pool of like millions of signals because the, the base is just too high. There are just too, way too many signals that it, it's just easy to find something weird and something interesting. But it's just hard to follow up on those to see that if they are actually indeed true signal. So that was that part. And that was, uh, this was the people that I, I worked with and a, a professor and that's me with the pandemic haircut here that you know. <laughs> okay, so that was the parts about techno signatures basically looking for the, the, the evidence of past or present technology. And there's some, another approach that people usually use, uh, many people in our, many of our astrobiology friends, they're looking for a biosignature, which is basically some kind of molecules or some kind of fossils. I mean, fossil is, is way, too, way too far, but some kind of molecules or stuff, substance that could only be produced by life. And uh, that's how we look for life in some pretty far distant exoplanets that are just pretty far away. But I'm not gonna get into that today because that's gonna be, hopefully gonna be another future Astro on Tap talk. So stay on track for that. Okay, enough of this science thing. Let's get back to the conspiracy, okay? Okay, I, I, I think that uh, many of you have heard of this last year? I mean this year. So this year, May 17th, there was this first public congressional hearing about UFO, or they changed it into UAO, something um, unverified, uh, air, air, yeah, that, that one. So I don't know why they changed the name. But so anyway, so they have this first public talk in 50 years. And they reported 400, more than 400 sightings of UFO, and they have about 11 near misses with the US Navy um, airplanes or fighter jets. So why did that give, why was this happening? Because it, it never occurred before in 50 years, and now all of a sudden it's just like, let's give a talk about UFO. Are they looking for more funding? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, does it mean that there's alien or is it a national security threat? So I was actually just talking to my undergrad professor during Thanksgiving, of course, after, after the dinner, after the nice Thanksgiving dinner, we got to sit down, have a few drinks and talk about aliens, right? Because that's what astronomers do, okay? <laughs> right? Of course. <laughs> so we were just talking about this. <laughs> it was just some kind of Funny things that we always talk about, about are those UFO real? Or are they just some kind of weird, weird, um, weird planes from another countries? And I, I really like one of the arguments that my, my professor make. It's basically that if our enemies, I'm not going to name the countries, but if our enemies have, have those advanced technology, why don't they just take care? I mean, why don't they just take over the world already? Because there's no way that UF, US can... can uh, can uh, battle the, uh, come back against those weird flying machines because, right? And uh, why, why don't we take a look at this congressional hearing video? Okay, this is from uh, NBC News. <laughs> right, right, right. So those those are UFO here, okay? He said they're real. And they need to be mitigated. 
Yep. Yep, the Pentagon, yes. Okay, they're flying. Okay. They're green, they're triangular. They are flashing. The object drops into the water. They want to put sensors underwater. Congress is frustrated about lack of answers, aren't we all? <laughs> All right. So, conclusion is that we have those weird sightings of the, the some UA, UAP, and oh, yeah, right. And and we don't know what the hell those are. So we, we need more money to figure out those. All right. So that was the conclusion of this. But one weird part of it is that they have actually recordings of those kind of flying objects that does not have some heat exhaust. I mean, they have infrared cameras on on the on the fighter jet for sure, right? So. Why don't they see any um, kind of heat getting radiated because of the engine or something from this kind of airplanes? And, and why can they just like levitate for a long time? Or why can they dive into the water? Because we, we know that our fighter jet probably cannot do that now. Or maybe, maybe they're hiding something. But those are some weird parts of those uh, so-called uh, UFO videos that we cannot explain, but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Maybe you, you have an answer, but uh, we, I just want to put this on the table that it, you, you realize that there's, there's something out there and we don't understand what those are. Could those be aliens? I don't know. Could those be humans? I don't know, but uh, hopefully with the more funding, they can find out soon, okay? Oh, okay, all right, back to, we are near the end of my talk, so let, let, let's go back to the to the to the weird stuff I saw uh, earlier at, uh, in uh, Joshua Tree National Park. So here was the reminder of what I observed and what are some weird confusions, some of the questions I got. Okay, so let, let, let's make some educated guess. See what, what what could those be? Okay, first, maybe it's a helicopter, right? Because it, uh, it it can for sure levitate on the sky, okay, and it, it can flashes, okay, but it could not it, for sure it cannot fly across the sky in 20 seconds. I I don't think that's the case, okay. So what about some airplanes? Because when it flew by, I heard some engine sound and, and it flashes and it flew and, and it flew pretty fast. So maybe it's an airplane, okay. So that's the second possibility. What about the third one? Um, Maybe it's a fighter jet, but it doesn't make sense that the fighter jet is so bright, right? You're not, you're not, you're not going to just tell the enemies that you are here for, for them to attack you, right? Okay, yeah, I agree. <laughs> I don't think that's the case. Which brought me to the last probable results, which is not UFO. It might be a rocket, and uh, I, I think it might be the most convincing answer for what I saw. First of all, is kind of orange because of those combustion, and then second of all, it's pretty fast. Um, maybe maybe it flashes. I don't know. So that is the the most plausible answer that I, I think about. Maybe it's a rocket because there are some rocket uh, run, launching site near Joshua Tree National Park. So yeah, so I think that the one, or maybe is a UFO. Who knows? Okay? Okay, all right, maybe it's a UFO. So let's take a look at this, 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 um, uh, this source. The source is a uh, National UFO Reporting Center. It's pretty reliable, okay? 
we, we can 100% trust that. Okay, so this is, uh, on the on the x-axis is the year, number of year. And then on the y-axis is the reported incidence of UFO. We can see that it was increasing over time. And then it peaked about 2013 or 14. And then the UFO just went home. All of a sudden, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a sudden drop in the reported UFO cases for some reason. We don't know. And then we, it went back again, went, 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 went back up again. I don't know, for some reason. So, so as a, a, a citizen, or just like not a scientist, or you are a scientist, how do we find them? I have proposed some solution. We need that, OK? OK? OK, so l l let me tell you why, OK? So we have been seeing, I mean, people have been seeing UFO for, for decades. But then all the videos and images they took are kind of crap. Why? Because we need this kind of lens camera on, on your phone all the time, OK? We need those technologies to, to, to get a good picture of UFO, OK? But more than that, we need this. <laughs> We need that in front of everyone all the time. So we don't, we never miss them, okay? Every time they appear, we catch them. We, <laughs> we hunt them down, okay? So those are the, pre, uh, the two proposed solutions I got. How, how do we find more of the UFO? And that concludes my talk. Thank you so much. All right, any questions? Yes. All right. Oh, yes. The question is that: Do we need more money or resources for finding those UFO? I absolutely agree that we need to pay, we need to get more funding for the grad student to, to get on those targets. <laughs> That's for sure. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right, okay. Yeah, the question is that are we have more telescope coming soon to uh, more radio telescope to detect those signals? The answer is yes. I think the, the next generation telescope is going to be called the Alien Telescope or the Allen Telescope. I think it's probably Alien Telescope. <laughs> right, so it's, I think it's, a, I, I, I look it up today, it's a, an array of telescope that is going to be focused on uh, directly focus on SETI. So it was built, is, is, it, is, it is getting built. Not sure how long it takes, but it's getting built. So it's going to be solely focused on SETI. I'm not sure, but if you look up like alien, teles alien radio telescope, you can, and you can find them. Yes. Right. Yes. That's a good question, right? So when we make those filters um, to to uh, filter out those false false positive for our radio signals, uh, one group of students were actually looking on on cross matching the satellites, and that is the uh, the, the answer to that question. Yes, there, people always work on cross -match matching satellites and the signals, so we can remove those kind of trash out of our our database. Uh, Yes, yes, Autumn. <laughs> well, if it's not the not a good one, we wouldn't be using that. So, yes, all the way back there.
Yes. Okay. The question is that how long does our radio signal pro uh, propagate before it, it becomes noise? That is a good question, and I forgot the answer about that. But there is a limit to how uh, to how how, long, how far it can propagate. I just forgot. Sorry. Yes. Well, there's, you know, there's also lizard man. <laughs> well, I don't know. There's just something of our curiosity about space. I mean, otherwise, I wouldn't be studying astronomy. Otherwise, all the students here wouldn't be studying astronomy, astrobiology, right? It's just our human fascination about space. I want to learn more. OK. Yes, last question. Right, I think many people have made that argument before about not looking for alien life. It was, uh, was Stephen Hawking in one of them or not? Right, yeah, I, I don't know, but maybe. But anyways, thank you everyone for coming to the talk. And have a good night. Astro on tap. <laughs> okay, the, ne the next Astro on Tap and the final Astro on Tap of 2022 is going to be on December 28th, the week after Christmas, here at Bickerson's, starting again at 7 p.m. And then keep an eye on our social media because we have something really big in, in the works for January as there's a massive uh, astronomy conference being held here. And so we'll have guest speakers and I think two separate events. So keep your eyes on our social medias and follow them if you don't. Um, so let's just thank our speakers one more time, Trent and Chester. All right, everybody get home safe, stay warm. And if you won trivia, come get your prize.